So my next guest is uh, somebody who I've known for many, many years, although for some bizarre reason, we've never actually sat and spoken about him before. And he's a fascinating human being. He's got an incredible range of experience in many different places, doing lots of different things. Uh, he's been uh, a profoundly uh, involved person in everything that he does. And he's extremely enthusiastic. He's also, I think, quite inspirational to many of us in South Africa because he always sees a silver lining and he's always trying to help other people. And uh, I don't mean that in some kind of like twee, facile way that he goes around as a do-gooder. He just seems to be one of those people who manages to make everybody else around him the priority. So for today, for the first time ever, Howie Saxton, we're going to make you the priority. So I hope you're really un uncomfortable about this. <laughs> I'm absolutely terrified. <laughs> it's nice to see you, man. I feel like I'm at a therapist on the couch. <laughs> yeah, well, you may just be. We'll have to see how it goes. But you really are an incredible guy. I mean, I've, I've known you, what, 20 years or so, probably about that at this stage. You mean since I was born? Yeah, because, of course, you're so young. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> we, nobody really knows how old you are. Um, no, the, the reason I, I say that we've known each other for a long time, we've never spoken about you, is because mostly we talk about the things you do. You know, you're obviously very involved with many causes. You've been involved with a lot of media projects. You've been involved with a lot of businesses over the years. And I think for many people, um, they would say, as they do with me some of the time, jack of all trades, master of none. But I don't think that's true for you. I think you've actually mastered a number of different things. So we're going to talk about some of those today. Well, it's 10,000 hours. I've put in a lot of hours. <laughs> but 10,000 hours in one particular discipline, right? And in your case, it's been many. I think I've put in a lot of 10,000 hours <laughs> over the you've, years. You've earned many 10,000 hours. Okay, so let's start off with, you're actually a lawyer by training. Yeah, but I don't admit that in public. No, I was going to say, we won't hold it against you during this interview. So yes, I'm a lawyer by training. <laughs> I, uh, I had to make my parents happy. I went through uh, Wits University. I came out as a lawyer and I went to go do my law articles and I was bored out of my mind. Wow. And I thought, if I actually stay in this profession, I'm probably going to kill myself. Listen, um, you did better than me to get to articles. I, I quit halfway through final year. You were a wise man, let me tell you. But you know, at work, the lift doors would close and I would think, oh my goodness, I can't believe it's Saturday. And I realized at that point in time that I had to do something no. that brought me happiness and meaning in life. Because if I didn't, I would just stagnate and go nowhere. And so I gave up law as soon as I could. I qualified. I worked for a few few months as a lawyer. And then I had army issues. It was still in the days of compulsory right. military so you, conscription. You had to go and do military service. Well, I actually left the country. You know, you Where did to, you go? So miraculously, as I was contemplating, was I going to jail? Was I leaving the country? Uh -huh. I got a call from Brandeis University in the United States. And they said, we're setting up a program in political advocacy are you interested in being one of our first students? We'll give you a scholarship. And then began a life full of activism and of taking up political causes and being interested and involved in politics. Because that really has been a theme since then, right? I, I keep on taking time off life <laughs> to go try and prove things along the way. And uh, I think that's been kind of one of the marks along the way. So, in fact, my activism started long before that. At school, I was politically active. At university, I was enormously pol politically active. I was head of the South African Union of Jewish Students. I started the Jewish anti-apartheid movement. I was involved in the end conscription campaign. I was very involved in trying to get political prisoners. Troublemaker. I was your official troublemaker. Yeah. I used to arrive home smelling of tear gas on almost <laughs> a daily basis. And my mother would say, you can't live like this. You must leave the country you're going to go to jail but instead yeah, I, mean, I decided that this country was actually worthwhile fighting for and you continue to to fight for the country even though the country doesn't always fight for the causes that you care about i mean it's interesting to me that you know people who like you were involved at an early age in the anti-apartheid movement should now be considered by the very people whose side you were on to in so many ways not be on their side anymore when it comes to things like israel isn't, well, it, isn't it weird? Well, it's not just Israel. It's on South Africa. Lots of things. You know? Exactly. And We'd like South Africa to actually function properly. And exactly. And people that's, don't want that. That is our priority, <laughs> you know. And so I think I've always been on the side of the people of South Africa, and I continue to be on their side. And at some point in time, that meant we had to over, overthrow a racist apartheid regime. 
Right. And now it means we actually have to overthrow an ANC government who have really damaged irreparably the country. And we have to get it back on track. Isn't it amazing, though, to think that now you can say things like that? I mean, I know you also involved in Cyril's campaign yeah. at some point, right? You know, when it came down to a choice of Nkosazana, Dlamini Zuma, and Cyril Ramaphosa, for me, there was no you, choice. You, you chose and, wrong. And <laughs> you I, chose no, wrong. I think, I'd rather have had her with her smoking ban. And at least we knew that she's crooked from the get-go. No, I, I must tell you... I Cyril, we've had to find out the long, hard way. I always say to people, I don't think he'll be a good president, but I think he'll be much better than Nkosazana, and I think I was right. I just didn't realize how terrible he would be. But the amazing thing about South Africa is we don't suffer from natural disasters except for our earthquake on Saturday. It's not it like... It wasn't we... even a disaster. I mean, a couple of garden chairs were knocked over. Exactly. Yeah. But we don't have earthquakes. We don't no. have famine. We no. don't have volcanoes. All of our problems in this country are all man-made. Mm -hmm. And that means an amazing Particular thing. Particular group of men and women, I've got to say. But it means we can fix them. Because if humans created them, humans can solve them. All, all right, we have to do is get good, ethical, strong leadership in place that acts in the interest of the country rather than in the interest of the individual or the party. I couldn't agree more, but I'm not going to let you spout forth with rhetoric because I actually want to talk to you about you. So okay, the, the fact is... Like being Jewish in 2023. Let's just talk about that for a second. You know I'm a huge supporter of Israel. You know that I have tons of Jewish friends. Um, it's hard for me to explain this to the Yorks, but the, the Yids are big friends of mine. And there are different kinds of being Jewish, right? Um, and South Africa, unfortunately, is one of those countries where a lot of people see it as a very binary thing. I mean, there's first of all being culturally, ancestrally Jewish. Mm. Then there's being religiously Jewish, which is, again, divided up into different categories. And then there's being a whole kind of, there's a secular Jewishness, which is very different to the religious Jewishness. And that secular Jewishness has provided an enormous amount of civilization in the world for four or 5,000 years. What is it to you, because I know that it's an important part of who you are. And it's an important thing for people to understand and you can explain it to them because every person I've ever met who claims Jewishness claims a different kind of it. You know, you, you want five opinions, put two Jews in a room. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, people who are, for example, Catholic would think of Judaism as a religion. Correct. People who are Italian would think of Judaism as a nationality. Right. They have different interpretations. Mm -hmm. Jews don't fit into any of those categories. Some people think we're a race, but we're a race of Indian Jews and Chinese Jews and black Jews yeah, and white Jews. Right. And, you know, that doesn't fit into any of the categories. Even Sephardic and Ashkenazi couldn't be further apart. Exactly. Right? I mean, the majority of Israelis wouldn't have passed an apartheid test for being white. Mm -hmm. The truth is we define ourselves as a people. And that has lots of different elements, and you don't have to believe in all of the elements. Yeah. One element is religion. One element is culture, and an element is language, and an element is attachment to a historical land in the land of Israel. All of that is part of it. Mm. And you can be a completely secular atheist yeah. and still be a 100% committed Jew. Yeah. You can be an enormous Zionist, but not believe in anything else. And you can still be 100% accepted as a Jew because mm. you don't have to believe in all the legs of the table. You just need to believe in a few enough for the table to stand. And that's what many people on the outside don't actually understand, that we're a people. And we're a diverse, remarkable people. When, when you look at me, the South African Jewish community is unique because all of us landed up here from Eastern Europe. So we don't have the black Jews of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. We don't have the Chinese Jews of Kaifong. We don't have the Indian Jews who, who came or, from... Or the, or the few Iranian Jews yeah, that still exist. The, the Farsi Jews, yeah. many, mm -hmm. many, in fact, uh, of them who exist. So people who know the Jewish community in South Africa presume that Jews are all white. But Drake is Jewish. Yeah, but then... Yeah, and Lenny Kravitz is Jewish. this is also what's happening in America. And, you know, why I brought this up is because you are very, very good and adept at explaining these things to people who don't know them. And the reason I like you to explain it is because you also have an experience of meeting people from all over the world and being very involved in issues pertaining to Jews in South Africa or the state of Israel or any of these things. And I think it's worthy of explanation. Probably one of the reasons I find myself so drawn 
to the Jewish people is because I also don't like the idea of belonging to too many things. I like to choose what I belong to. And even there, I'm very circumspect. So I feel like maybe that's one of the reasons I um, I feel an affinity to the Jews. But there is an uptick in anti-Semitism in the world. And I can't help thinking it's because people have become a bit incurious about what these terms mean and how everyone does define themselves because it's become much easier in a world post sort of 2015, 16 for people to just cancel whole blocks of people or individuals or claim that a certain group of people belongs to this category and therefore they are oppressors or they are the oppressed. How do you feel that this uptick in anti-Semitism has come about? And what do you think we can do about it in South Africa and the world to understand it better? So I think what we've seen, can I quote Yuval Harari for a second? Right. Very, the, very uh, good scholar from Hebrew University, right? Absolutely. And yeah. probably the greatest thinker of our time. Well, certainly one of the most incredible people to be able to distill the story of humans. I mean, both his books, Sapiens and Homo Deus, Incredible. And very importantly, 23 questions for, or oh, 21 questions for the 21st Absolutely. century. Absolutely. Also a good book. But, but yeah, what does he say? Yuval Harari says, in order for human society to progress, we have to believe in common myths. Says the first great myth, if you want to call it that, was the myth of God. And because we agreed to believe in a God, we structured our society. You had to behave as a community, otherwise you'd be punished in the afterlife. And through that belief, society progressed. The second great myth was the, the myth of money. Somehow a coin or a piece of paper had value, mm -hmm. and therefore we could trade with each other. I didn't have to bring my horse or cow to trade for your property or your hay. And so money allowed humanity to progress enormously. And he says the third great myth was the myth of human rights. Coming out of the Second World War, we agreed that the world could not continue with these massive wars with millions of people dying with a Holocaust where six million Jews yeah. died. We had to believe that human life intrinsically had value. We had to treat each other well. We had to be able to decide our own government. And he says, going back four or five years ago, he fears that we've stopped believing in that great myth. When do you think that happened? Because I'm sure he would date it to fairly recently. I, he does date. I, mean, I think in this country, we certainly believed in it up to a little while after 94. Oh, we certainly did. And I think there's still, and then there's still vast swathes of humanity that do believe in that stuff. And I think it's important that we continue to. Absolutely. But you know something? Sometimes leaders give their followers permission to be racist. And I think we've seen that in the United States. Not that Donald Trump is necessarily a racist, but the racists feel, felt comfortable to come out of the woodwork because they felt they were protected by someone who wouldn't put them back into their corner. Hmm. And we saw that in the United States. We saw that in South Africa, beginning with Thabo Mbeki, when he brought race politics back into South Africa. Yeah, yeah. And, and we see that in Europe. If you take Hungary, for example, with Orban as, as president, and you see the rise of right-wing fascism in parts of Europe. But, I, but I, don't you think, and you're one of the few people I can talk to about this, so forgive me if we keep going on tangents. Um, don't you think that it is clear to anyone who's watching, anyone who's got a little bit of an understanding of history, we can see when the right wing behave badly. We can see when the right wing start with their authoritarian, racist stuff. And it's become, rightly, demonized. And people know what it is when they see it, and they can identify it almost immediately. But the stuff that's coming from the left, and this is why in America in particular, it's a lot more complicated now than it was before. A lot of this anti-Semitism in America is coming from the left. And, and that's a right. But that's much, yes, of course. But I've already explained mm. that we understand what, we can see what that is. You know, people with tiki torches and swastikas, and you know what that is because we've we've seen that before. There's been enough of a of an evolution of those terrible ideas for us to be able to identify them at a fairly safe distance. This stuff that we're seeing now, which is a very different kettle of fish completely, is based on a different kind of prejudice, and it comes from different people. The people who before we thought would be the least likely to exercise any kind of prejudice. You look at um, these, these Congress people who are openly anti-Semitic, you know, uh, Rashid Talib and um, what's her name? The, the, the woman from Minnesota. 
um, I forget her name now, uh, even, even Ocasio Cortez in New York. They say things like it's all about the Benjamins when they're talking about the Jews. They, they, they make uh, very subtle and sometimes very direct attacks on Israel, which are actually not about Israel. They're actually attacks on Jews. They use code words. Code words. They call them dog whistles. They can identify them when it's about race, for example, or gender or transgender stuff or you know, sex or whatever, but they don't want to identify this stuff when it happens with, with Jews. Why do you think the left is getting away with the kind of anti-Semitism that they are? Well, first of all, I don't think it's new. And we understand extreme left and extreme right. I mean, right. Karl Marx was a, as about as left as you can get, and he was a massive anti-Semite, even well, though he was Karl, Jewish. Karl Marx was Jewish, of but he was But he was a self-loathing but, Jew. But for example, when you go down the generations, they purged the Communist Party in the Soviet Union of Jews. They murdered the Jews. Yeah. The extreme, and all those pogroms. The extreme left and the extreme right always meet in fascism. Yeah. And there's no, so it's a horseshoe. It's not a... It's well, not it's a, a, probably a circle. The more left or the more yeah. right you go, it's about right. the more racist and fascist yeah. you are. And you have to just you look at the United Kingdom. Look at the Corbyn side of the Labour Party in, in the United Kingdom. Right. I mean, you don't get more fascist, racist, anti-Semitic than the Corbynites. Yeah. And the fact that they can't even self-reflect and understand their own racism mm. is, in fact, terrifying. But we can't get away from the fact that the extreme left and the extreme right are not mainstream. The vast majority of people just want to get on with their lives. They want a future for themselves and their kids. They want to build a better society. And we can't allow the fringe voices anywhere to actually be heard louder to to be amplified and that's of course the great problem of social media social media democratized people's voices there was a stage mm -hmm. when the new york times was the newspaper of record mm -hmm. and now some imbecile you've never heard of who's a racist on social media grabs the headlines and can can command an audience which is far larger than that even if it's only for a short while exactly because the the mainstream media love to to latch onto okay, those but, things but my point is still if you look at New York, for example, New York of all places, right, which has been a haven for so many people from all over the world who were looking for a place to belong. And it's a, it's a cultural center. It's a vibrant cosmopolitan place. There's also a large Jewish population in New York, right? Yeah. And New York, if you look at all the attacks that have been perpetrated over the last 10 years against any group based on hate crimes, you know, sort of just violent attacks on people because they're wearing a, 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 a hat or, a, or a, a kippah or whatever it might be. The vast majority of these, and it's increasing, are against Jews. And this is in America. That worries me. I think it should worry us everywhere because we've seen this history before and we see it repeated over centuries. You know, the pogroms of Eastern Europe meant that so the Jews of not, Eastern Europe... Are people not reading history books, Howie? Because this should be a concern. This should be a major concern. Of course they're not reading history books. Who reads? Oh, well. You know, today they listen to podcasts and maybe doing a oh. podcast and this is important. But, you know, every single day people send me screenshots from Twitter in South Africa of bigoted, racist, oh. anti-Semites mm. commenting about things that they don't know, fabricating information. And somehow they have a voice. Some of them are in parliament. <laughs> Some of them are definitely in parliament. Most of the parliamentarians actually are too moronic to even understand how Twitter works. But the truth, the truth is we have to stand up. There can be no bystanders in history. This is why we're talking to you. And it's one of the reasons because I, and, and when, we, when I said earlier that I want to talk about you, you stand for things, which I've always admired tremendously. And even if it gets you into trouble, I've seen you go up to people who disagree with you and say to them, listen, we've got to talk about this thing because I don't like to live in a world where we ignore each other because you've chosen not to understand me or because I've chosen not to understand you. I've seen you do it in person to people. And I think that that is enormously admirable. And I, I see you stand on principle, even when it costs you. And it has in the past. I mean, you've, you've been an activist, you've fought against apartheid you've you've been in our independent electoral commission you know watching that the elections are free and fair these are things that are not thankful great glorious tasks they're tasks that most people would avoid at all costs and yet you do them and this is tremendously to your credit but for those people who are not as brave as you are 
What do they need to know? You just said no by, bystanders. But for most people, they think they can just slink into the shadows and let racism, anti-Semitism, injustice occur. How do you not let that happen? And, and how can the rest of us start to man up? You know, the truth is, I don't believe anyone has to be a victim. And we are victims if we do nothing. So let's take South Africa currently as an example. Right. We can, we can stand back and do nothing. Yeah. And we can watch an ANC-EFF alliance with Paul Mashatile as our next president and Julius Malema as our deputy president. We can watch that happen and be the victims, or we can do something about it. Yeah. If you don't register to vote, if you don't go to vote, if you don't donate to a political party, if you don't actually go speak to your friends and your neighbors, if you don't go campaign, then you deserve what you get. I am not a victim. And I will never be a victim. And that's why it's really important. I, I want to give you the most stupid example, but a friend of mine when we were at university, and we all grew up with racists all over us. Mm. And am I allowed to swear on your station? Say whatever you like. So this person, his family were racist. They would go to Shabbat dinner. His family would speak derogatory of black people. And he said to, him, to them, you know, if you do this again, I'm going to swear. And so the next Shabbat dinner, when all the family were there and the cousins and the friends and someone was racist, he said, pass the fucking salt, please. And his family were never racist in front of him again. <laughs> it's little things, huh? Each time someone is racist in front of you and you don't stop them at that moment and mm. say, hold on, I don't want to be complicit in your racism. Please don't speak like that in front of me. Each time we do something that small, we're taking a stand. And you can take a big stand. You can take a small stand. You can write to your newspaper. You can protest outside a government office. Or you can just speak to your brothers, your sisters, your yeah. parents, and just set a tone of values of what's acceptable and not acceptable in a modern society. And it's not to force down your opinions, but it's to allow for an environment where people are not just tolerant, but accepting of each other. Exactly. So, okay. I mean, you, you, you've done so many things and let's just list a couple of these for people who don't know. Um, you're the non-executive chairperson of the Jewish Report newspaper. Um, you're the chair of the Jewish Achiever Awards. Um, you've also been involved in the Melrose North Community Action Network, where you fed over 250,000 people during lockdown. Um, you've started, you're a media man, a mogul of a kind. I mean, you've done shows from all kinds of places with all kinds of people. You really are extraordinarily well connected, not only to the local and the, the diplomatic community, but to people in all four corners of the world. Um, with all of this going on, how do you manage your time? Because most of us have trouble just earning a living and being in survival mode. And here you are doing all these other things that don't necessarily bring you money or glory, but they're things that you feel are important. I think everyone has to find meaning in, in their lives. And for me, part of that is having to juggle a number of things. Yeah. I have to juggle some work because I need a salary at the end of the day and I need to survive. And I juggle community stuff. And one of the things that we started completely inadvertently, just at the beginning of COVID, the board of the Jewish Report met and mm. said, well, what can we do to help South Africa? And before anyone had ever heard of Zoom or webinars, we said, well, there's going to be a need for information. Let's put together we didn't know what was called the webinar at the time, yeah. but let's put together something just to help people. And we gathered doctors from all over the world on a platform. We thought a few hundred people would arrive to get advice of what to do with your shopping and what to do with mm. your clothes when you, and thousands of people arrived. And we thought, well, maybe there's a need. And so we brought on psychologists in the second one. And the third one, we brought on nutrition experts and exercise gurus. And the fourth one, we brought on comedians because we thought we needed to uplift the mood. And it's morphed into storytelling. We're busy running a film festival at the moment, an online film film festival. And just the people have been astounded. We've been watched about three and a half million times Phenomenal. with massive following in places like the United States and Canada and the UK and Australia and Israel. And we've got people who watch us in Bangkok and Kenya and Nigeria and the UAE and Panama. We've got a following. That's amazing. Uh, and and we just believe that we can tell remarkable, inspiring stories about individuals. So Simon Sinek came, came yeah, on our show. I mean, what a cup what a, what a, uh, to get him. So one day I get a mail from someone and says, would you like my nephew on your show? And I said, sorry, who is your nephew? And he says, Simon Sinek. 
And wow. I said, well, you know, here you've got one of the biggest personalities in the world. Yeah. So, of course, I want him on the yes, show. What, what was amazing, uh, we were doing a practice run with him, and uh, I was sitting in my TV room, and suddenly he said, can you just duck to the left? And I ducked to the left. I don't know why. He says, those paintings behind you, who they buy? I said, oh, Cromwell and Gobeni, my favorite artist. Yeah. said, I need a set just like that. So we sold him like a ten thousand uh, dollar set of paintings <laughs> wow. during our during our practice session sure um but we've had bill browder talking about his fight with vladimir putin mm. and we've told the story of the woman in gold and had randy schoenberg coming on to the lawyer who actually got all the gustav Klimt paintings restored to their rightful owners and you know tito and Boweni came on one day and the one question i really wanted to ask him he tweets out cookie yes cookie, recipes recipes so but our, he seems to burn more stuff than he than he gets right. I mean, he voluntarily eats pilchards. So my first question <laughs> Not is: filter be, fish. Before <laughs> before we ask anything of any note, I want to know what his pilchards recipe is. Wow, so sh- okay. he gave his pilchards recipe. So we've kickstarted the South African economy with South African business people. After the riots in Durban, we got the three big optimists in South Africa, Mike Abel and Adrian Gore and Robbie Brosen, hmm. to come talk about how do you view the world differently. And it's just created this massive following around around the world and around South Africa. And we're just so grateful. Of course, it takes a huge amount of time. I mean, you know how much prep work you have to do before every session. I mean, this is just another feather in your cap. But you are committed to saving South Africa and to being optimistic about South Africa. And I do feel like people are fairly exhausted at this point with all the load shedding and everything else. People are feeling really put upon. Um, How do you find it in you to have the energy to inspire other people Um, because sometimes it's hard enough to even get up in the morning and go, okay, I'll, I'm going to deal with this stuff. And I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimistic, positive guy, but I have my days where I wake up and go, "Mm." and it's not about geography. Hey, I know that the rest of the world is not necessarily better, but to find a reason to do more smile, feel that purpose that you were talking about earlier, where do you get that well spring of, of, of energy from? So have you ever found another country where you would rather be than here? No. No. This is my home. I don't even think about it. Don't want to be anywhere else in the world. Same. And that means I have to make sure that I have a future in this place. And every morning I get up and say, what will make this the place that I not only am, but the place where I want to be? And I I do believe each of us are empowered. The people who wake up depressed in the morning feel they can't do anything about it. You have to provide them with the tools to allow them to make a difference, to make this a viable place to live. And that's what you said about not being a victim earlier, yeah. right? You're either going to be a participant in the most active player in your life, or you're going to be a victim. Those are your only options. 100%. I mean, yeah. we're, we're fortunate. I'm going, I'm going to make some guesses about your life. But I guess you went to private education. No. Oh, you didn't. Okay. Government school. Government school. Private healthcare now. Oh, yes. Private security? Uh, yes. Do you have solar or generator uh, well, just in your this home? Just year put in solar. You've built a bubble around yourself mm. to make your life li- livable in this place. Yeah. But think if you're a person in the township. No, I think about this all, all the time. Not even in the townships. I think of people who rent property and can't do anything about solar. I think about people who uh, have water problems, but, but you know they don't necessarily live in the middle of nowhere. They're living in what's supposed to be an urban serviced area and they don't even get what they need. But God help you. They might you even you... be paying for it already and they don't get what they need. God help you if you have to go to a government hospital. Oh, look. You're if, right. If you have a chronic prescription from a government hospital, you have to go once a month and wait in line for a full day to get your prescription filled as opposed to five minutes to pop into the skim. Yeah. To get that that's 12 days of your leave a year. You're sitting in line yeah. at a government hospital yeah. just to get your prescription. What the hell is wrong with us? Why don't we actually care about the people out there? And it's and it's always the people at the bottom who get screwed the hardest, right? Because as you pointed out with regard to me and, and probably you, is that we have largely been able to, through fortune and our own resources, insulate ourselves against the more predatory and nefarious and delinquent parts of the state. But for most people, those are not possibilities. Those are not even options. Um, And it shows you, again, that we've got so much work to do. But I always think where there's there's a problem, there's a solution waiting to be found. Exactly. And we've, we've got 
incredibly resourceful people in this country who have great ideas. They hustle. They uh, they come up with plans. I mean, you've got talented, creative people. And you don't have to have fancy education or private health care to be able to get in there and do your thing. I agree 100%. You know, I think within each of us, we have to say, well, what skills do we have? Mm. What skills can we use ourselves to change the environment around it? What can we do to help our neighbors? So you spoke earlier on at the at the start of Cape Town, uh, at the start of uh, COVID, the Cape Town uh, community started these things, things community action networks, where mm. they adopted townships or squatter communities to try and feed mm. them. And we had Glenn Wallman from the Angel Network on a webinar one day, and she was talking about this. And I said, okay, I'll take Melrose North. It's a small little area. It's the area where I live in. I've got a very close relationship with the people of Clifton. I don't know if you've spent any time in Clifton in Soweto. It's disastrous. Mm. Clifton is very famous in South African history because that's where the Freedom Charter was, 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 was signed. signed. Yeah. And, of course, that said South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And government came and they took the square where the Freedom Charter was found and they paved it and they built a monument and they built a hotel that no one's ever stayed in. And just across the train tracks mm. is the community with no sanitation, where sewage runs through the roads and the roads aren't paved, where no one has water in their own homes, where no one collects the garbage. And those are the people that government forgot. And I said, let's take Melrose North and let's try to feed the people of Clipdown. So I went door to door with pamphlets, literally saying, let's adopt this community. There were WhatsApp groups for each of the roads, started posting on that. And every Friday, Lan Austin Driver and I would take a trailer and we'd go door to door and ring, do you have any food? And soon our trailer wasn't enough and we needed trucks. And amazingly, uh, the guys from Thirst, who had no business at all because alcohol was banned, said, okay, we'll give you the trucks and our staff because we're paying for them. We've got no business, but we want to do something good. And we would load truckloads of food on every week and every Sunday. We'd deliver food parcels for months and months yeah. on, on end. And we fed a quarter of a million meals during the start of COVID. And it absolutely it took people who were otherwise feeling helpless, not knowing what they could do. It actually gave them something to do where they understood what they were doing for South Africa. And we have to find all of those little things in people's lives to empower them to do good. So what, what are the things that keep you up at night now? Because there are enough concerns. If you just look at all the things that you're already involved in, there are enough things to keep you busy and to keep you concerned about things. But what are the, um, the big issues in Howie Saxton's mind? So can I say I sleep perfectly well at night because I have really busy days. Okay, uh, You're too tired, you're I'm too too, tired to lie there wondering to, about things. To okay. worry about those other. That's good advice, though, because you keep yourself busy. You won't have time for, oh, how do I feel about this? And no. the truth is I have to learn, as all of us have to learn, is how to say no. Yeah. I'm doing enough. I'm right. focusing on a few things, and I'm going to get those things right. Okay. I don't have to do everything. I don't have to be bad at everything. I just have to be good <laughs> at one or two things where I think I can can do that right. And so I'm focused. I, okay. I've got balls in the air, but, you know, I'm chairman of a newspaper and I need to make sure we get an unbelievable world-class product out every week. And I've got a brilliant editor and an amazing team. And we're doing these webinars and we're getting still ridiculously large audiences, even though COVID is over. Mm -hmm. And we, we're producing great content and, and doing amazing historical uh, stuff stuff on that. And I'm involved in politics because I believe we, for the sake of South Africa, we have to oust our current government from power because that is the only way we can actually progress as a nation and create a better life for all South Africans. So I'm focused on that as well. And I'm focused on the few things at work that I have to deliver because I, uh, I've got some what, company. What, what, what are you worried about? I mean, there must be some things that worry you. So I, I'm actually not worried. Really? I, you know, are there things that concern? Absolutely. I choose the things that I'm concerned about and I decide what I'm going to do to change them. But you're not one of those people who gets all anxious and feels disempowered or any of that stuff. I grew up in the middle of apartheid. <laughs> I was shot at, chased by police, battened, charged, tear gassed so often. What must I worry about? <laughs> you travel a lot, you, though. I, You've been to 77 countries. Yep. And counting. And counting. I'm hoping to add an extra few on in July. 
now where, where you still have to, where do you still have to go where do you want to go and where's what's planned for july oh so uh my niece gets married in israel so i'm very excited my late brother's very oldest good. daughter and then i was thinking Mazel go tov. thank you hungary maybe bulgaria romania as a ah, trip, I have an Eastern block. Eastern block, because Eastern you know, block. when I grew up, we weren't allowed there with South African passports. Right. Now we can get in. So I, I'm thinking about there. But you know, I, I've got three university degrees, and the things that I learned in the world were by travel. Yeah, not from university. And <laughs> I don't go travel and stay in five star hotels, stay in local places. I want to meet the local people. I want to understand their culture. I want to understand their traditions. I want to understand their food. I don't want to meet tourists from New York and Australia. That for me is a complete wasted trip. <laughs> and and so I like of the 77 countries I've been to, you know, the pa- places that I'm most passionate about are the places that I don't understand. To go to Europe and go see another beautiful castle or remarkable cathedral, I know that. I understand the culture. Mm. Nothing shocks mm. me. I say, oh, wow, this is fantastic. But nothing expands my mind. Yeah. And that's why I love Asia so much. To be yeah. able to go to India where everything is chaos and dirty well, We were and talking bustling. about, before we started the recording, we were talking about Japan, which, I mean, the way you described it, it's fascinating how Japanese people interact with each other and the world. And it's just such a very different culture to everything that we're used to here in South Africa, right? So, you know, Japanese people are so timid of other humans, <laughs> they will do anything to avoid them. So where do you <laughs> buy each your, other? Especially each other. Yeah. Where do you buy your food from? A vending machine, because you don't have to deal with the person across the counter from you when you pay. So vending machines are huge in, in Japan. The I, I did this most remarkable walking tour of the red light district in Tokyo. Yeah. And the main users of the red light district are women, and it's got nothing to do with sex. But because Japanese women can't get Japanese men to actually communicate or talk to them, they pay huge amounts of money every evening to go to these clubs where scrawny, blonde-haired Japanese guys dressed up as if they were Korean speak to the woman. Wow. And the woman will pay a lot of money just to be spoken to and romanced without any sex involved. Because, And to watch this as an outsider, to watch this society... And to see their obsession with cleanliness. I mean, you literally could lick the streets. You know, no. people say that. But in Japan, you actually... Hygiene's a big deal. So hygiene's you, huge. You mentioned to me that the average Japanese married couple have sex twice a year. Yeah, 2.2 times a year. <laughs> There's too much intimacy involved in sex, so they don't like don't it so like much. It, eh? But, you know, they tell you, you could leave a million dollars on the road in Japan, and the only person who would touch that would be the person who would hand it into the police waiting for you to return. Unreal. What a remarkable society. What an incredible society. And, and so much to learn from them. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love India. India is my favorite, yes. favorite place in, in the world. But you can never be alone in India because someone's always talking to you. <laughs> like, it's an amazing experience. People, <laughs> Random strangers saying, Leave your hotel. Come stay in my home. <laughs> Let me take you out. I was sitting on the beach in Goa and a group of guys arrive and they they say, who are you? Where are you from? We're collecting you tomorrow morning on our motorbikes. You're spending the day with us. You can never be alone you, in India. You can never be alone in India. <laughs> I, I, I love places like Cambodia. The temples of Angkor are, are oh, one wow. of the most remarkable things you could ever see in the world. Those are the things that blow your mind that expand your horizons and when you taste jollibees in philippines or you stand for five hours to go to sushi Taiwan, i i six thirty in the morning i stood in a <laughs> line for five and a half hours to get into sushi Taiwan for the sushi experience of my life and it was and it was right. you when you've got a sushi grandmaster and they've decided when you've eaten enough they say finish pay <laughs> But how incredible to be able to be able to have the privilege to be able to do do things like that, to go to supper in Vietnam and be above cloud levels and looking down at at the Frangipan mountain beneath you below cloud cover and hike through the rice te- terraces or to go through Unreal. the oldest rice terraces in the world in Philippines in Banaue and Bata. You're, you're, you're inspiring me to travel. I like this a lot. You have to, you know, go to Nepal. Start yeah. the Annapurna Trail and Fishtail Mountain in Pokhara. These are the great experiences in the world. I mean, go go into South America. I don't know if you spent any time in Central or South America, but climb some of the volcanoes. I one of my favorite things in the world in the Atacama Desert in Chile, 
to go with an astronomer for the evening in the middle of some of the highest mountains in the world and a telescope to see the night sky. And those are the things that, you know, I, I was very privileged to be invited to Shimon Peres, the Israeli former, former president's Prime Minister, yeah. 90th birthday. Yes. And it was a fantastic birthday party. Barbara Streisand came to sing him happy birthday. Wow. There was Sharon Stone and Robert De Niro and Bill Clinton and Tony Blair and me. Should, <laughs> should we say when <laughs> Tony me, Blair yeah. tells that story, the guest list may sound a little different. <laughs> but as part of it, he threw what he called the President's Conference. He brought the best speakers in the world and best thinkers in the world to talk to people. And I went to a masterclass by Daniel Gilbert, the world expert in happiness. Oh, yeah. And Daniel Gilbert says, when he became an adult, his mother said to him, there's three secrets to happiness. Get married, get a good job, and have children, and that will bring you happiness in your entire life. So he says, he devoted his entire professional career as a professor at Harvard to decide if his mother lied to him or not. Yes. And he asked the audience to vote. <laughs> Does marriage bring you happiness? The audience <laughs> votes no. Do children bring you happiness? The audience votes yes. Does money bring you happiness? The audience votes no. It says, actually, you're wrong on all counts. Statistically, married people are slightly, fractionally more happy than unmarried people, unless you're in a bad marriage, in which case you're in the most unhappy category possible. You need yes. to get out of an unhappy marriage as soon as possible. Can I say I'm completely unqualified to give that advice? Right. Children, do, Me too. Do children yeah. bring you happiness? Well, they go to mothers and they've got their children vomiting over them and pooing over them. And they say, would you rather be here or rather be at work? They'd rather be at work. Would you rather be here or with your friends? They would rather be with, with, their with their friends. So children actually don't bring you happiness, but they've worked out when they go back to the same mothers the next day. The mother said, oh, my baby was fantastic yesterday. They said, no, no, your baby wasn't. We were here. You were hating life. <laughs> the human brain and evolution has programmed us that you don't remember how difficult your children were because otherwise you'd never have a second one. Right. So actually children and don't bring you and the, and the job, well, does money bring you happiness? Everyone votes no. The truth is they've done the studies at Harvard. And it turns out the question is wrong. Hmm. The lack of money brings you misery. Yes. But money does not bring you happiness. Right. And they've actually pegged it in America. It's about $72,000 a year. If you learn, earn below that amount, you're always worried about money. Every decision is can I afford, can you yeah, not? Sure. Once you've achieved the minimum threshold, money is no longer a factor in your life. The difference between someone earning $72,000 and $200,000 a year in terms of happiness is actually non-existent. So, so, then, so what he says, if so, I can just I mean, finish so, the so, point. So, hang on. You and I have both then dodged... I think all three of these bullets because <laughs> I, I haven't been married and I sometimes think, well, maybe I, I'd be happier if I was, but you cleared that up for me. Thank you very much. And Mr. Gilbert, number two, the, the job, I mean, I, I've fashioned my own job much like you have out of thin air, which out of is passion. great. Yeah. Which is lovely. And I love it. And the third thing, having the kids, I sometimes think about that too. And I think, well, maybe that would give me a real sense of like destiny you know, but the way you describe it, I think maybe I've lucked out on all you, three. You may very well have lucked out. But <laughs> so how about, how about so, you? Same so, thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so Daniel Gilbert says, well, what does bring you happiness? And he says, well, they've tested people. Does a diamond ring bring you happiness? Does a new car bring you happiness? The answer is yes. But 52 days later, you're exactly as happy as you were before. Mm -hmm. Physical possessions bring you a moment of happiness, 52 days worth of happiness, and then it's over. And the only thing that they've discovered that brings lasting happiness is life experiences and in particular travel. Really? And the more effort you put into your travel, the longer your happiness lasts. Someone who goes on a life experience trip, their happiness is increased for a period of two years from the time of the trip. That's amazing. And the, long, the more effort you put into by not using a travel agent, and forgive me if you've got a lot of travel agents who are watching <laughs> us, but... The more effort you put in, the more you will enjoy the experience and the longer 
the period of happiness lasts. I and so, so great. I've tried to fill my life full of remarkable experiences. Mm. You know, maybe it's the hot air balloon trip. Maybe it's mm. the, the eating in a remarkable restaurant. Maybe it's meeting special humans. L last night, I had dinner with David Cameron, the former British prime minister. Oh, yeah. And it just so happens just before that, Benjamin Zander, the most famous conductor in the world, calls me. He's just landed in Pretoria and he needs a favor. And I say, Ben, I can't do it now. I'm having dinner with David Cameron. And he says, oh, okay, I'll come with. So Ben Zander, the, the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic, gate crashed our dinner with, How fantastic. with David Cameron. But, you know, experiences sure. like that will last. No, My happiness a, will amazing. last forever. And sometimes it's meeting people like Gareth Cliff. <laughs> For many people who will say, wow, what an amazing experience that was. And their level of happiness will continue for years thereafter. So until... You say in your biography, until you can find someone to fund your lavish lifestyle, <laughs> you have to work. But what, what is your day to day? So I'm luckily since the start of COVID, I'm no longer operationally involved, but I'm involved in a number of telecommunications businesses, okay. uh, Sycom Voice Services. We do voice over IP and we do internet and cloud-based PBXs and telecoms is really my bread and butter, mm. as well as I'm involved in the hospitality industry. I, I'm involved in some hotel ventures, all of them start up. Day-to-day -day operations has no interest for me. I love starting yeah. things. And once they're operational, I love to let go of them. And they're people far more qualified and better than me to run things. But I'm great in the building stage. Right. And I think we all need to know our strengths and our weaknesses. Doing the same repetitive job every day has no interest for me whatsoever. So I, I love starting new things. I'm an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, we fail we yeah. all have to fail. That's part of being an entrepreneur. But on the ones that we succeed, and nothing happens without a lot of effort. And I think we 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 need to give that lesson to Generation Z who feel that they can go and everyone's got a side hustle. Well, either be 100% in your side hustle or be 100% in your main hustle, but you will never be successful in anything if you're not devoted. You know, you and I both know we've all worked those 18-hour days for years at a time. When I ran the country's elections, I was doing an 80-hour week for six years of my life. Yeah. Now, I gave the people of this country, if I can say modestly, peace, freedom, and democracy. Not that they appreciate small, it. Small achievement. A small achievement. <laughs> you know, it's not my fault if they, fault if they made poor decisions at yeah. the ballot box. Uh, you, you, only, you, you just create the mechanism. <laughs> you can't guarantee the result. But in order to do that, I literally had to work 18, 80 hour work weeks. Jeez. And in fact, when we were delimiting the country into voting districts, we had a bottle of port that at 10 o'clock, a few of my management team and I would sit down and have a 10 o'clock port. And then we bought the 12 o'clock port and the 2 a.m. Mm. port and the 4 a.m. port. I mean, by the end of the night, we had drunk a lot of port, but we were going through. No the wonder night. our country looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, even running the first democratic elections in South Africa, and that is something that I'm enormously grateful to have been a small cog in the wheel of. But to give the people of this country the opportunity to decide their future was a holy mission. Mm. And there were weeks, literally weeks, where I didn't go home. I'd sleep under my desk. In uh, the second democratic elections, I moved a caravan into the showgrounds in Pretoria, and I slept for three weeks in a caravan with no heating. And it was the middle of winter. And you know how cold. I mean, today, Johannesburg is like three degrees. Yeah. Uh, but I lived in a little tin can for weeks on end because I just didn't have time to drive back to Johannesburg. Everyone has to put in the effort. Nothing happens. You cannot be successful without effort. And people look today and they look look at some of their superstars and they look at Elon Musk, but they don't say, well, you know, Elon's working probably 20, 22 hours a day in order to achieve what he's got. Yeah. So yeah, is Tim that's right. Cook. That's what it takes to be successful. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, you, you are a tremendous success. And as I said at the beginning of this discussion, a huge inspiration. I'm just glad that we got to sit down and, and, and pick pick your brain a little bit and kind of figure out what's going on in that very, very busy mind of yours. And you've taught me a lot in this, uh, this short space of time. I've learned an enormous amount about the world and about you. And uh, it's just delightful to spend time with you. You're great. You really are. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And of course, these things are reciprocal. <laughs> You're coming on my show soon. <laughs> oh, boy, I knew there was going to be a catch. No, with pleasure. Anytime. Thank you, Howie. Thanks, Gareth.